Hello, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started now that it is 7.02. Um, hello, my name is Emma Snape. I am the manager of public programs for the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage in Cleveland, Ohio. On behalf of everyone at the Maltz Museum, at the Nancy and David Wolf Holocaust and Humanity Center, and the Ohio Council for Holocaust and Genocide Education, I want to thank you so much for being here on Zoom for tonight's program. Tonight's is the first in a series of four events dedicated to understanding the Holocaust and how it was possible. There will be time for a moderated Q&A at the end of the program tonight. Please send any questions that you have for Jody and for Mark through the chat to Mark Cole or through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any time during the program. In order to get tonight's program started, I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Mark Cole to take over from here. Dr. Mark Cole is the Executive Director of the Ohio Council on Holocaust and Genocide Education. He teaches in the History Department at Cleveland State University, specializing in modern Euro Europe and Germany, specifically the history of Nazism and the Holocaust, Jewish studies, as well as the histories of consumption and food more generally. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, Emma, and thanks to my partners, uh, the Maltz Museum and the Center for Holocaust and Humanity. I have sort of an easy job tonight. My job is to introduce uh, the Director of Education at the HHC, uh, Jody Elowitz. She's asked me, uh, she begged me not to give her full bio to keep it very, very brief. So um, I'll say two things. Um, she's been the Director of Education there for about five years or so. Um, and she is a wonderful human being. Um, and I'm happy to be working with her um, on this program. And as Emma said, I will be moderating and I will turn it over very, very quickly to Jody um, so she can get on with her presentation. And then we'll have lots of time at the end to um, answer some of your questions, but feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, and I will, where it, where I think it fits, I'll, I'll stop Jody and interject and we'll have a discussion. So I think it will be much better if we allow for more of an organic conversation to develop and Jody just isn't speaking at you for one hour. So, uh, Jody, please take it away. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mark. You're a wonderful human being as well. <laughs> um, and I do enjoy working with all of you. So I'm um, happy to be here tonight. Um, and of course, with Mark's expertise and mine, um, we look forward to having a bit of a conversation um, going back and forth ourselves. Um, so um, I am going to pull up our little PowerPoint. And so tonight's talk, as we know, is how is it possible? And so we will begin here with this question. And I want to engage people who are, uh, are with us tonight. Um, please feel free to put your um, thoughts in the chat. So um, I would like to start off with when I hear the word Holocaust, I think what? Um, and I'll give you some um, times that some time for you to put um, some things in the chat. Um, I really want to get, like I said, I would love for us to have more of a discussion than me talking, but certainly I have my own thoughts on this. And Mark, I'm sure you have your own thoughts on this. So let's see what we have. So I think one person said killing Jews. Is that correct? Yep. Tragedy, yes. concentration camps. Go ahead, Mark. Systematic destruction of the Jews of Europe, absolutely. Tim, no fair, you know. <laughs> Tim's cheating. Tim's cheating. <laughs> Hate, Hate propaganda. Mm -hmm. So those are all excellent um, things. And this is really about our own personal relationship to the Holocaust. So some things that you know I think about is, and I hear when we're teaching, whether we're working with teachers or with students, we hear it's overwhelming. Um, it's incomprehensible, um, it's emotional, uh, it's depressing, unknowable, um, indescribable. Um, and I wanted to share this quote with you from Peter Hayes, who is a scholar, um, a former scholar at, well, he's always a scholar, but uh, he was at Northwestern University since retired, but yet the Holocaust continues to resist comprehension. Despite thousands of books, labors of countless historians and other scholars, the topic often gives rise to a form of intellectual and emotional despair. 
So our goal for this evening um, is to kind of help us get over this despair, to get over the, these feelings, these emotional feelings, um, and to think about it in a way that we can process um, and think about it historically and put it within the context of history so that we can learn from the Holocaust in order to make connections to our world today and to think of how we um, can use this information um, to be the best of humanity today. So moving forward, um, how do we overcome this despair? Um, and um, one of the things that I always ask is think about what you know and how you know it. How did you come to the Holocaust? How do we know about the Holocaust? Um, and, and Mark, please feel free to jump in here too. But with you know what we find from most people that they know about the Holocaust from um, popular culture, from film, from literature. Um, and that gives us a much different appreciation for this history. Um, it gives us a different, it's, it's more about representation than the actual event itself. Um, and that's why we want to look at the Holocaust within the historical context. And that was a human event. I think that's something also very important that we um, look at tonight is that this was a, a global event um, that was perpetrated by humans um, on other humans. Um, the Nazis were not aliens, they were humans. Um, and that sometimes makes us uncomfortable, but it truly is a human event. Um, we have to understand that it was not inevitable. There, there, it could have been stopped at any time. Um, and that, you know, because of indifference and other factors, um, it was not. Um, we want to understand the rich mosaic of Jewish life. Uh, what was Jewish life like before the war? Um, one of the things that we never want to do, and the scholar Doris Bergen has led us, you know, um, on this path many times, is we don't want to start through the gaze of the perpetrator. We don't want to look through that lens first. First, we must understand who Jews were, who Jews are today, um, and why that is so important to our understanding of this history. Um, tonight, we will explore the factors that led to the rise of Nazism. Um, we'll examine how the Nazis use propaganda, and we will explore the progression of policies and actions that led to the killing centers. Um, Mark, did you want to add anything to like how we can overcome this type of despair? Yeah, I, I just would like to reiterate this point. You mentioned Peter Hayes, um, and you're, I think the quote is probably from his book, Why, um, where he's really written um, just a wonderful book that I highly recommend where he um, essentially condenses um, much of the Holocaust scholarship that is available um, into a very readable uh, narrative. And the center point of this narrative is the event is like any other historical event. We can understand it as long as we don't let those sort of emotions get in the way. Yes, it's difficult, and Jody mentions, you know, wrestling with this stuff is difficult, but it's explainable, it's knowable, um, it's not beyond comprehension, and that's a really important point. Thank you, Mark, I, I totally agree. And I also um, agree with you on your assessment of why um, I highly recommend it as well. It's a very, a very good book in terms of if you want to um, dive into this a little deeper. It is, a, it is an excellent place to start. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Jewish life in Europe before the war. Um, you're looking at some photos from our collection, from our museum. Certainly the Maltz has um, a rich collection of, um, uh, of, of, of Jewish life. Um, and what we want to do when you come to our museum or when we're doing workshops or we're talking like we are tonight, is we want to recognize that Jewish life in Europe was very diverse. Um, it was very rich. Um, there were people who were very religious. There were people who were not so religious. There were people who had money and wealth. There were people who had no money and wealth. Uh, people who lived in urban centers like Berlin. Um, and then there were also people who lived on shtetls in Eastern Europe. Um, and, you know, this is a life that was very rich. And one of the most important things that we can also do to help us understand the Holocaust is to individualize it, to like get away from the numbers of six million um, and think about each one of these individuals behind that number. Um, this is how you can also form a personal connection to this history um, and that the stories will resonate um, with you because the stories are very similar to um, stories that we all have. Um, and that's something that's very important to us. 
Um, and again, it gets us away from the gaze of the perpetrator and it shows Jews as they really were um, and as they really are now even, very diverse community. Um, so that's a very important thing that we need to um, think about when we are talking about the Holocaust. Um, Mark, did you want to add anything about that as well? No, nope, we're good? So let's talk about some of the factors and Mark, I hope that you'll jump in because I know some of these things are in your area of expertise. So let's talk about some of the um, factors. I think the first thing we should talk about is anti-Semitism. Um, many of us who are on this um, Zoom tonight, we know that anti-Semitism didn't end with the Holocaust. We know that it is certainly a problem that is still in our world today. Um, and that it, it's, it's a very, it has a very long history. The, na the word itself is rather new. It was coined in 1879 by a German journalist named Wilhelm Marr. Uh, Wilhelm Marr was beginning to equate, it was, a, it was about the social political climate of the time. Um, Wilhelm Marr begins to associate Jews with race, uh, as being a race, which the Nazis pick up um, and really um, um, specialize in. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But anti-Semitism is also known as the longest hatred. It's been around for quite some time. Um, and the Nazis, like I said, the, they racialized it, but they used historic forms of anti-Semitism to push forth their ideology and um, their method um, and to create this sense that Jews are an other um, and that they are the enemy of the German um, people. Um, and so um, there were many forms, there were several forms of anti-Semitism that, you know, we usually focus on. One is a religious anti-Semitism in which in um, the earlier uh, Middle Ages with the rise of Christianity, um, there is a sense that Jews will not convert to um, Christianity and it causes a lot of conflict. And so Jews, um, you know, are looked upon as somehow a or religion than Christianity. So there's this notion of religious anti-Semitism. And then we have what's known as social economic anti-Semitism, where Jews are being used as scapegoats. Um, they're being looked at as people who control money um, or who uh, borrow or lend money. Um, and that's where some of these stereotypes that we have with us today um, stem from. And then you also have what's known as racial anti-Semitism, which is really where we get to here with Nazism um, and how um, if you look at, they're looking at Jews as a race, as a lesser race, um, and that plays into this hierarchy of, um, of, of uh, races. Um, Mark, did you wanna you know, chime in on anything with anti-Semitism? Um. No, I think I think you've got everything. Maybe when we get to nationalism in halfway down the list, I'll, I'll right. try to. Okay, I'll turn it over to you when we get to nationalism. So the next thing we want to talk about is aftermath of World War One, and certainly the aftermath of World War One was extremely devastating for everyone, especially in Europe, but especially for Germany. Um, Germany um, was held accountable for World War One. Through the Treaty of the Versailles, the Allies, um, you know, had set reparations to be paid, and many um, they lost a lot of territory. Um, it was the collapse of the Austro Austro Hungarian Empire, um, and so lines were shifted, uh, territories were shifted, um, and Mark um, will talk more about like that effect of reshaping countries, how that played a role in the rise of nationalism. Um, in, in Germany, in the aftermath of World War I, um, they had lost uh, a lot of men, um, and those who did come back were psychologically scarred, um, and this creates an atmosphere of, of uh, a, a political atmosphere in which there are many political parties. Um, you have the rise of the Weimar Republic, um, and we don't have time to go into all of that tonight, but um, that gets into the failure of democracy in Germany. Um, and so they, the German people were dealing with a lot of different issues. Um, there, of course, was the economic depression that we'll get to in a minute. But these are all of the after effects of World War I. So let's talk about nationalism, Mark. Why don't, why don't you give us a sense of um, how nationalism played a role as a factor um, in terms of the rise of Nazism? 
So it, it, Nazism is essentially a nationalist movement, but it, it, it's a, a rat. It, one of the things that I always tell my students is um, it, it's not very, you know, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis were not very good at thinking up their own ideas. Um, they borrowed heavily from existing ideas that were around. You just said anti-Semitism was around. They radicalize it. Um, ideas of the problems with the Treaty of Versailles and all of these things coming out of World War I. Nationalism is, depending on which scholar you ask, an invention of the late 18th century or early 19th century. And I call nationalism the um, absolute deadliest idea that humanity has ever created. As a result of nationalism's invention, probably in the early 19th century, um, we have World War I, World War II, and the Holocaust. You know, 100 million people will lose their lives. And nationalism um, is an important part of that. Um, and it's sort of interesting that I don't think most people understand what nationalism is. They often equate nationalism with patriotism. And I think we have to be very, very careful with that. I understand patriotism and the definition of patriotism is pride in your country. It's sort of inward looking, right? Um, it, there's nothing wrong with being proud of where you come from or who you are. Nationalism isn't inward looking, it's outward looking. It's we are better than everybody else. We deserve more, therefore we should take it. We should have it by all costs. And it's that outward lookingness, that comparativeness and that competition that nationalism creates in the 19th century that is so dangerous because it leads to clashes between countries. It leads to clashes between um, uh, between races, um, and it also leads to, you know, and it, it devolves into war and genocide, and this is why it is certainly one of the worst ideas that humankind has ever thunk up, I would say. Thanks, Mark, and I mm -hmm. think you, you made some really good points there um, about it being an outward-looking movement, but also we should also be clear that Nationalism was not just significant to Germany, it was significant to many countries in the aftermath of World War I. Um, like I said, many countries after the maps were redrawn, um, many countries had regained their statehood, like Poland, for example. Um, and Polish nationalism is completely different than German nationalism. Um, and so, though, you know, that's something for us to consider too, that Germany, it's not an isolated incident, is guess what I'm trying to point out. Yeah, and, and for the teachers out there, one of the best things you can do is you can show your students a map of Europe pre-World War I and a map of Europe post-World War I. And of course, the post-World War I shows that you no longer have the Russian Empire, the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, or the Ottoman Empire. And you now have a whole bunch of brand new states with brand new borders. And if you start drawing, sometimes randomly, sometimes very methodically, new borders, you're going to include people inside those borders you want, but you're also going to include people you don't want, and you're also going to exclude people. And if you have very strong nationalist feelings that you belong to this group and you've been excluded, or if you are part of the majority and there is a minority which you don't like because of your nationalist feelings, these are where we're going to see lots and lots of problems play out in those former empires in the aftermath of World War I. So this is, Jody's making an excellent point here. Thanks, Mark. Um, and of course, you know, we talked about a little bit uh, about the aftermath of World War I in Germany and the economic depression, but we also have to remember this was a worldwide depression. Um, and that also that it took place, of course, in the United States, we know about the depression here in uh, our own country, um, but it was a world, it was a global economic crisis. It wasn't just isolated to Germany, though Germany was hit very hard. Um, there was a, a great inflation in um, Germany. Um, the depreciation, the, I'm not even gonna try to say the word tonight. Um, it's been a long day, but you know, there was um, you know, much economic upheaval in Germany after World War I, as as it was in many other countries as well. Um, and of course, then the failure of democracy in Germany. Um, after um after World War I, um, they became a democracy, um, the Weimar Republic. Um, they were everyone to have a voice and an opinion. And so there were many different um, political factions fighting for superi superiority, if you will. Um, and that caused a lot of chaos. 
Um, and so that was another factor in the rise of Nazism. And Mark, you might be able to say a few words about that too, um, in terms of like the political chaos that was going on in the Weimar Republic. Yeah, I, I you know, the, we have to think of the, the, I call it the experiment with democracy. You have to understand that the Weimar Republic is the first time that Germany experiments with democracy and it experiments with it under the wor absolute worst possible conditions you could imagine. Um, a defeat, um, a terrible economy, um, a severely truncated state, both economically, geographically because of the war. Um, and trying to move forward and with um, a, a lot of factors working against it. Um, and these are one of the things that lead to the failure. Uh, historians would be careful to say though that it was predestined, it was not predestined or doomed to failure. Um, there were some very tangible advances made and it need not have gone the way it did. The depression of course is going to change that um, very dramatically. And one of the things that I would also, actually, I think I'll wait till this and I'll bring it up at the end because I think it kind of, uh, it will be a, a nice wrap up. Um, Jody, there was a, a question that I missed on the last slide. Um, and it says there was an insignia on the image that you had between two, the two swastika flags. Um, I was gonna go back and look it up, but I don't, do you have that image? It's on the examining I, the, the factors. Image is up. The image is actually up. Um, oh, here it is. Okay, I can see it now. At. And I see what you're saying. And I, I have to look up the photo again to tell you where this, this, this scenario is playing out. I believe that may be in front of a university or a government building or something. So the emblem would be, it's probably of the town that this um, rally was taking place. I, I want to say are. that's that's right. I can't make it out, but a, it looks like it could be a university insignia or some sort of civil for an individual town or. Right. Yeah. And I think that's something to bring up too when we get to um, talking about how the Nazis, um, you know, put their ideology out there they would go from town to, there would be rallies from town to town or Hitler would go through German towns, um, you know, and that's, that is what's going on in this photograph. Hitler is going through this town. You can see people with cameras um, and people have basically come out to see him go through the town. Um, so that was just another way for them to get people to um, participate in their ideology. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute because it's so important. Um, international government indifference, um, you know, this has to do with, you know, knowing about the Nazis, knowing, um, this is what, you know, even as we're moving forward into when Hitler comes to power, understanding the policies of, you know, the Nazis, um, the Nazi party, um, and also understanding, you know, how when Hitler comes to power, like his ideology, the thoughts behind the party, um, the chaos that is taking place. And, um, you know, as we've talked about, there are other factors going on in the world at the time. Other people are experiencing economic depression um, and other factors that, you know, would have not had them like ha have so much that they're going to interfere in German politics at the time. Um, of course, that, you know, we were aware of many of the things going on, but again, um, you know, there are other factors at play and we only have an hour, so we're not going to get too deep into that. Um, and then we have to think about the political charisma, the militaristic inclusiveness and manipulative propaganda of the Nazi regime, even prior to Hitler coming to power, um, putting out their message um, and also playing on that hurt that uh, the, the idea that somehow the soldiers who fought in World War I were stabbed in the back. Um, and of course, the stab in the back theory has to do with that it was Jews that sold out, um, you know, the German soldier, which we know is not true. Um, but this is one of the other things that play into the roles of, um, you know, rise of Nazi, uh, the Nazi regime. Um, Mark, did you want to, anything else you think I missed or? 
Um, the one thing that I that I would like to stress a little bit, um, and you're you're trying to get us uh, through, is so you can't talk about everything. But one of the things that I think that's often sort of overlooked in examining um, the importance of the rise of Nazism um, is the existence of communism and Bolshevism. Um, that is, this right. was something that the Nazis talked about ad nauseum. They were the ultimate bugaboo for them. Um, and it, we see later on in the Third Reich, the equation in the German language with Jews with Bolsheviks, they're used synonymously oftentimes in the speeches of high ranking Nazi officials. Um, and so the threat of Bolshevism was something that needed to be stamped out, that needed to be exterminated. And the sort of coalescing of these two groups and this intermingling of two groups in the Nazi imagination, um, and I stress the word imagination there because it wasn't a commingling, um, is kind of a really important factor in this as well. Yeah, this is usually where we also talk about the protocols of the elders of Zion, um, which was a hoax that was created in Russia, um, which was first published in 1903, um, picked up a little traction in 1905, but much more traction in 1917, um, you know, because it was after the Russian Revolution. And then what you have with the protocols, it's the foundation for all um, conspiracy theories. And it is the first time that Jews are starting to be equated with Bolshevikism. Um, and certainly the Nazis picked up on that and used it to their advantage. So you see, this kind of, like Mark is saying, you see this sort of mixing of of um you know the political with what you know they deemed racial so that they're creating jews as this threat this threat as an other not just as jews themselves but through the notion of communism and jews being attached to bolshevikism of course at the same time because anti-semitism is not logical um you know jews are capitalists and communists you can't be both at the same time but that's exactly kind of how this works anti-semitism is not rational and it's not logical <clears throat> all right so we better get moving on since we're we're we're, we're uh we have a lot of ground to cover um, so we've been talking about the rise of Nazism, and now we are um, in the 1930s. Um, uh, Hitler um, becomes chancellor of Germany, and um, through various um, uh, legal uh, procedures, he becomes the dictator um, of Germany, and um, the Nazi government is in full force. Um, and some of the ideology that they um, prescribed to has been broken down by Dor the scholar Doris Bergen to race and space. Um, one, this is a racial ideology. Um, and then the next step is to spread Germany out um, in terms of something that we all know is manifest destiny. That was something that German, um, the German government looked at our government um, to um, the history in the United States. Um, and they, um, you know, they wanted to reclaim their living space um, for, that they lost during World War I, but it was also much, much more. Um, and we don't really have time to get into all of that tonight, but so for our purposes, we'll just break it down um, as Doris breaks it down to race and space. And then, of course, you have state and government sanctioned laws against Jews. Um, as Mark and I were just talking, the first people who were rounded up and sent to concentration camps weren't necessarily Jews, they were communists, they were political opponents. Um, Dachau opened in March of 1933, um, you know, just a couple of months after Hitler uh, and the party took power. Um, and so you have, um, again, you have these ideas already put in place, you have laws that are passed very quickly, um, and so you have this happening very fast. Um, at the same time, there is this propaganda program known as Strength Through Joy, um, in which um, every aspect of daily life is inundated with Nazi ideology and propaganda. Um, they used pageantry, mass marches. You just saw the photo of the marches, um, or you know, going through towns and marching through towns and and and, and getting the. Uh, the um, citizenship um, excited. 
You have the big rallies like you see here. Um, you have sporting events. Sport was very important to putting across the uh, messages of the Nazi party. You also can think about the Berlin Olympics of 1936 that fits in here. They used it as a propaganda tactic um, in order to um, show the world that Germany was this wonderful place. Um, they kind of covered up all the things that they had been doing um, and, you know, uh, created this uh, pageantry uh, all around the Olympics. Um, and you have film, uh, Lenny Reisenthal, who was the Nazi filmmaker who made film um, The Triumph of the Will, in which she is capturing a Nazi rally. She's creating this mystique around the Nazis. Um, she's building Hitler up as as a god, as someone who has been delivered literally from the clouds above to save Germany, to bring Germany into the 20th century. Um, and so you have all of these different um, ways that uh, the Nazi party is operating to bring these messages. Art and architecture um, and daily life um, from the smallest postage stamp on an envelope, um, uh, toys, uh, pins, um, you name it, um, they were um, pushing it forward and they really knew how to use radio and film um, and, and all of these items in order to get people excited about what was going on. Uh, Mark, it looks like you wanted to say a few things there. Uh, so yeah, just very quickly, Strength Through Joy um, is an interesting Nazi. It's technically a leisure time organization. Um, it, it subsidized tourism and, and um, educational outings uh, for Germans. And to, to, to maybe think about Strength Through Joy in a little bit different way, um, the, you know, we look, we understand Strength Through Joy is one of the reasons why the Germans increasingly sort of, um, even if they hadn't voted for Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, um, they became, you know, the, the regime became ever more popular because it looked like the regime was actually doing things for them. Strength Through Joy provided working class people, um, you know, uh, vacation opportunities that only the elites had, you know, 50 years before. Um, so they were, they were actually really doing things for people. So that kind of explains um, you know, the popular support side of things, at least a little bit. I wanted to go back and Susan asked a really good question. She, she wonders when the point German Jews um, sort of realize that like during the Weimar Republic, where it was regime change after regime change after regime change, it's a sort of a, a, a literal turnstile of regime changes, um, because nobody can get anything done or be very successful. There's more than a dozen um, Weimar regimes, uh, parties come in and they're thrown out sometimes just a few months later. Um, she wonders when's that moment when German Jews figure out that the Nazis aren't going anywhere. Um, and Jody, I don't know if you have a point in mind that you would think, oh, okay, this is, this is at least when things are radically different from what we've experienced in the past. I think for me, I mean, I mean, this is, I think other scholars might have a different opinion, um, but I think for me, it's the Nuremberg Laws of, that were released on September 15th, 1935, where, mm -hmm. you know, they, the Germans make it very clear that Jews are no longer citizens of Germany. Um, mm -hmm. I think that is the, you know, that is the first, like, real the moment where you might be saying, oh, that's a problem. This is not the same. Um, you know, when the the first laws that are passed, um, I, you know, they're, they're passed very quickly, um, you know, provide, you know, Jews are starting to be not allowed to do, be in public office and not allowed to practice law or medicine as, as, as that goes on. But I think as soon as those laws come out and it's very clear that Jews are no longer considered citizens of, of Germany, that that is like that, that, that one turning point. And then of course, I think the, the, the biggest turning point is uh, Kristallnacht on November 9th and 10th, 1938. And Mark, you might have a different opinion. No, I totally agree. Those would be the two sort of number one and number two, and you could make arguments for either side. Um, and and it, Susan has a, an ending part, I guess it's a two part question on here. 
um, as he said, when would the German Jews have realized that the Nazis would not go away um, and that they would be exterminated? Um, I don't know that they ever, and I don't know that that's a fair question to, to ask of them. How could they realize this? This is something that never would have crossed anyone's mind. It hadn't happened before. Um, so the, the extermination part um, you know, the extermination doesn't begin, you know, in, in reality until 1941, um, late 1941, 1942, when the Holocaust begins in earnest. So we have nearly a decade of Nazi power um, being in existence before the Holocaust actually begins. Um, Susan, uh, university professors are sort of famous for this. You talk to us and we give you books to read. Um, if I were, if I wanted to answer that question about how Jews interpreted, German Jews interpreted this situation they were in, um, you could do no better than Marion Kaplan's Between Dignity and Despair, um, where she talks about the how German Jews interpreted the regulations, the lulls, the Nuremberg laws, all of these different things. And they, they were all a whole bunch of mixed messages. They thought things that were good when it had settled down. They thought they could wade thing, through things like Jews had done in the past. Um, and they were never really sort of sure of themselves. And so Marion Kaplan's book is a beautiful book um, where she talks about a process that she painfully calls social death. All of these promulgations in laws, as they accumulate, they increasingly push very assimilated German Jews out of a society and out of a country in which they deeply love. And this is one of the things, this is kind of one of these issues of identity as well. Um, you know, most German Jews thought of themselves as German first, Jews second, um, and they couldn't quite wrap their heads around what is really going on here. And again, I don't know that it's fair to sort of think that they're supposed to, the phrase is read the writing on the wall. Um, it's a much too complicated process for us to, you know, in hindsight, we could ask this question because it seems pretty clear to us because we know what's going to happen. But in the 1930s, they could not have known what was happening. And Peter Hayes in that book, Why, um, you know, suggests that this is in many ways a deeply problematic question to, to pose because it's unfair to those people who are living through the situation, who are doing their best individually to try to interpret the, you know, the, the, the events that are coming from Berlin or from their local groups or wherever it might be. Um, so Susan, thanks for that question. Excellent. And, and to build off of that too, something that we haven't talked about because we were talking about factors, but once, you know, there were many, many Jews who tried to get out of Germany, who, who to Susan's, the urge, what you just said, saw the handwriting on the wall or just felt like, you know, I'm not waiting it out. I'm, I'm out. I want to get out. Um, and then there was nowhere to go. Um, you know, we have to think about immigration laws, the immigration quotas of the United States. If you wanted to come here, there's the um, immigration law of 1924 that, you know, has the quota system and you're keeping, you know, people out. Um, and then um, you also have like you need a sponsor. The Germans did not make it easy for Jews to emigrate. They they made them leave behind their businesses and money with money was involved. And you have to think about it. Even if you did get out and you went east or if you went to France, um, you know, you would eventually be caught in the net. So even if you thought you were you were getting away um you know it would catch up to you eventually um if you couldn't get out but it should be also noted that there are scholars who don't know think that hitler actually ever had a plan and that the nazis sort of just kind of you know made it up as they went along so you know it would be really hard pressed for us to like like be able to say that um as mark said it's 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 too hard for us to put ourselves in that place um, but there were many other things going on at the time, too. So even if you did get out um, or you wanted to get out, um, you know, it wasn't easy to get out. Um, and, you know, if you went certain places, you got caught up in World War II and eventually the policies. Yeah, Jody, this is an excellent point. And Susan, Jody's talking about a major sort of his, a debate among historians, whether there was a plan from the very beginning to, to exterminate European Jewry, that is from like 1933 on, 
or was the Holocaust much more a product of the conditions as they changed on the ground? And I would say, I'll go out on a limb here and say the vast majority of scholars would say something like, um, it, there, there were some inkling of ideas, but the decision for mass murder was made sometime, probably we're gonna say um, late, uh, late summer, early fall, 1941. At least that's the evidence, the best evidence that we have for it. Um, and so if there isn't a premeditated plan in the 1930s, this is one of those kind of big questions, then what does that mean? Um, why in 1941, and, and Jody's point about the war being so important, the Second World War being so important, I think is, is kind of important here as well, as is her point, um, even if they wanted to go, where could they have gone? Um, because they are stripped of their uh, property, their money, um, there's something called the Reich flight tax, which means they have to leave so much of their money behind. Um, and these are some of the double messages that Marion Kaplan is talking about. Jews are told by the Nazis, get out, get out, get out, but we're going to throw roadblock, roadblock after roadblock after roadblock in your way um, to make it very, very difficult for you to get out. So these would be some of those kind of mixed messages. Absolutely. Um, and then also, too, we have to understand, and Kristallnacht plays into this as well, uh, Kristallnacht that takes place on November 9th and 10th, 1938, is the first um, outburst of, of mass uh, violence um, that was planned, um, but it was made to look spontaneous. Um, and that, that was the first night that 30,000 Jewish men were rounded up and taken to Sachsenhausen, Buchenwald, Dachau, um, and that you have this violence out in the streets, you have Jewish uh, stores and property looted, you have synagogues burning. And, you know, we, we, the other thing that we doesn't get talked about very much is that the German citizenship was very uncomfortable with that violence. Um, and so the Nazis kind of like kept that um, in mind. And, and really a, a lot of the violence, if you think about it, it didn't take place in Germany. Um, the mass violence, the mass executions take place off German soil. So again, that's another thing that plays into this uh, notion of not like really being aware of really what's going to happen next. Um, and also to, um, if you wanna get into like the Nazi idea policies in terms of, of the extermination process or of the segregation process, all of those things, which we're gonna look at right now, we might as well just move along. Um, and go to that slide. Um, you know, World War II, as Mark said, is a very important um, piece to the puzzle. Um, as soon as the, um, the, the German army goes into Poland in 1939, um, anti-Jewish measures take place immediately. Um, it's not something that was uh, waited upon. Um, and then you have the isolation from the local population. You have the building of the ghettos. Now the ghettos were um, mainly in Eastern Europe um uh and and began right away in poland they began segregating the jewish population from the rest of the population um and then as mark was mentioning in 1941 um, we have what's known as the mobile killing units or the einsatzgruppen um and as the uh, when the nazi government declares war on the soviet union um and they start going into those territories in june 22nd, 1941. This is when those massacres of Jews throughout Eastern Europe begins. And so also too, something that I think is very important that we think about is the Holocaust by bullets, which this is now being called, um, was the way that the majority of Jews um, were murdered during World War II. Um, I think a lot of people, we think about the killing centers, we think about Auschwitz, um, and um, but we have to know remember that it really begins um, with these mass murders, this, these crimes that take place in broad daylight, um, and people um, are witnesses to this event, um, and you have the killers, um, one bullet per person, um, so it's a very personal crime, and also that, you know, where we were talking about there was no plan, um, if this was the beginning of the plan, then the plan changed because it was too hard on the perpetrators to continue this method of 
mass extermination. Um, so they go from um, taking the army to the victims to taking the victims to the killing centers and, um, you know, perfecting this um, mechanics of death, if you will. So, um, you know, this is all very much a part of how um, we are led towards extermination. Um, and I think it's very important, again, to reiterate that nothing happened overnight. Um, it did took, it took time. And again, we go back to this government indifference, people not stopping it, um, you know, letting it unfold in certain ways. Um, and of course, remember, we have to remember that the United States didn't get involved in World War One right away, and we're, excuse me, World War II right away. They waited until um, the bombing of Pearl Harbor um, December 7th, 1941. So um, again, there's a lot more factors going on. And this is one of the reasons why um, like talks like this are so important because I really feel like um, it gives you a sense of the history, the, the, the Holocaust's place in the historic timeline of events, um, which is very important because without certain things, um, you know, you could not have it happen. Um, you know, you have the collaboration of other governments um, and the allies of the Nazis during World War II. You have this, um, you know, neighbors turning on neighbors. You have, um, you know, long, uh, long time feelings of anti-Semitism and the equating of Jews with Bolshevikism in the Eastern territories which really plays a role in having local police or local individuals um, helping the Nazis exterminate Jews. So all of these things are factors. And uh, Mark, um, I don't know if you wanna jump in here. Jump in at the Q and A part. I don't want, I'm holding you back. <laughs> all right, so um, I, I'm, I think um, the next step is you know how do we define the Holocaust, and we'll get through this, and so that we can take a lot more time for questions and answers. Um, so for us, we define the Holocaust um, as the systematic, bureaucratic, state-sponsored persecution and murder of six million Jews by the Nazi regime and its collaborators. I should mention that this particular um, description or definition is from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, um, and you know we get asked all the time, what about the other victims? Um, and, and I always like think about it again, I'm going to go back to uh, Doris Bergen. Um, and I would also recommend Doris Bergen's book, um, War and Genocide, um, which is also a very good book in terms of historical context. Um, and she will talk about the fact that the Jews were the primary target of the Nazis, um, but they were, they were linked to these other victim groups, if you will. So um, during the era of the Holocaust, as the museum refers to it, they also targeted other groups, um, the Roma, uh, the Gypsies, the disabled, and Slavic people, Poles, Russians, and others. And then we already had talked about like communists, socialists. Um, we didn't mention Jehovah Witnesses and homosexuals. So there was all these various individuals that um, the Nazis went after. But those people who were actually marked for extermination were the Jews. And the term Holocaust, as we understand it, was created to describe that particular event. And I mean Holocaust with a large H. Um, and also we could talk about it. Scholars sometimes refer to it as the Shoah, um, which is a Jew, which is a Hebrew word, which um, is, is translated as catastrophe or disaster. Um, to do it, to make sure that we understand, like when we're talking about this period of time, we are talking about the murder of the 6 million Jews and not these other groups of people. Um, but certainly we can't ignore how the Nazis targeted these other groups um, because it's very um, important for our understanding of how the final solution um, was able to um, come to fruition under the Nazi regime. Um, why is it important? Um, I'm going to go to another um, scholar, Yehuda Bauer, who says the Holocaust can be a precedent or it can be a warning. I believe we should do everything in our power to make sure it is a warning and not a precedent. And I can't agree with Yehuda Bauer more. Um, Primo Levi has written the same thing. Primo Levi, for those of you who might know, he was an Italian Jew um, who survived who survived Auschwitz and wrote an amazing 
um, account called um, Surv um, Survival in Auschwitz or, and um, in that book, he also talks about the Holocaust as a warning um, that, you know, that there are alarm bells that we should be paying attention to. Um, and again, we can't change the past. Um, and we don't want to equate the Holocaust with current events. We can make connections in our own head, in our minds. If we see things and we say, you know what, this is kind of bothering me. I feel like I've, I've seen or heard this history before. Then it's up to us to take actions in today's world in order to make change. Um, so that's something to consider when we are looking at this, which leads us to the inspiring action part, which is um, for us in the Maltz Museum um, and for the council as well, like how do we use this history to inspire action today? Um, at the museum, we discuss it as up being an upstander, um, using character strengths um, that we all have to recognize our own abilities so that we can contribute to um, our communities to make sure that we have um, you know, good societies, good communities, um, and that we are being vigilant against this kind of language and behavior that could lead to violence. Um, and one of um, someone who I um, admire greatly, who's no longer with us, and in fact, I was fortunate enough to talk to her with her daughter yesterday on our speaker series, um, is Roma Kaltman, who says, I demand that everyone understand the vul vulnerability of humans to help us remember that vulnerability, we, we must never forget the Shoah. And again, this, I think, brings us full circle where we started talking about how the Holocaust is a event in human history. It is about humans. Um, and in order for us to secure um, the future, we have to look at the vulnerability of humanity as well. So, Mark, I am done talking, so I think we can answer some questions. Mark, you're on mute. Uh, I'm trying to unmute. Okay, did it, it unmuted me. You're unmuted. Um, so, you, you just kind of spoke to this. Um, I'm trying to find it. It has gone way back in the chat, but somebody um, had a question about uh, essentially trying to understand when, and they use the example of Iran, when we see a modern regime who is spouting um, all kinds of hate, is using propaganda, um, especially anti-Semitic hate, um, do, you know, how do we kind of uh, deal with those issues, those points? Um, you know, what the question, I wanted to get a quote, there was a quote in here, um, and social media spreading falsehoods, the reemergence of anti-Semitism in the US and Europe, um, is the world sleepwalking to another Holocaust, maybe in a different configuration, but with the same horrors awaiting? And I thought that was a powerful question. I want to I want to say I hope not, um, but I think this it's uh, it's very much about how we look at ourselves in the world today and think about um, inaction and think about what we can do. Um, you know, it starts small. Um, if you've raised, if you're aware, if you, again, I always say like, you know, we, we, you know, see it all the time um, where the Holocaust is being compared to certain things. And if, if we really truly believe that that comparison, you know, is there, I'm um, like, we'd like to talk about it in terms of making connections. But if you are looking at a news report or social media and you see these things, then it's upon us as individuals to point, to, to call it out, right? To like, to um, write our Congress people, to, um, to raise awareness of events that we feel very powerful about, um, but also to um, you know, call out anti-Semitism when we see it, um, to call out these things and to alert people to um, you know, these messages that are out there. Um, and you don't need to go to the Holocaust as like, you know, this is just like the Holocaust, because nothing is just like the Holocaust. Um, but, you know, if you see things that are disturbing in our world today, um, then you definitely, you know, should raise awareness about those events or call out those events um, and to be vigilant um, against hate, to stand up against these kind of things, um, to be an upstander is what we would say. Mm -hmm. 
And I would, I would put out a challenge. And one of the things I think about a lot is for educators, um, how do we, uh, how do we teach our, our, our students to become upstanders? Um, and I usually kind of offer a challenge to teachers to think up ways that in the classroom, you can not only teach them about the historical context. So, you know, about three quarters of the way through my Holocaust class at Cleveland State University, um, I asked the students, I say, okay, so we've been learning all this stuff. You know a lot about it now. Um, you know how it happened. Um, but what are you doing to make sure that it doesn't happen again or to any in a different format? Um, and, you know, they're, the students are, are quite, you know, honestly, sometimes awestruck or their jaws are hanging open because, you know, nobody's sort of confronted them in that way. And I think if our, our normal reaction is to be an upstander, to call out these things um, instead of being a bystander, um, which is in many ways, and many scholars would say, this is what made the Holocaust possible. It's that there were so many people willing to not do anything, to look the other way, to stand idly by. And so, um, you know, in your teaching, in your classrooms, I, I challenge you to figure out ways to get your students to be vocal, to call out injustice, to become in, in essence warriors for social justice in any way that they can. And that could be something like writing letters to congressmen or picketing or, you know, whatever, um, whatever it, form it might take. The form doesn't matter. It's the, it's the, the call. It's the putting a spotlight on injustice wherever they see it. And, and the good news is the Maltz Museum and the Nancy David Wolf Holocaust and Humanity Center have many ways to help teachers, you know, do just what you're saying. So mm -hmm. please contact us because we are more than happy to help with those um, with those ideas and those in, to inspire. Um, certainly, our mission is to ensure the lessons of the Holocaust inspire action today. So. Um, that's something that's very important to our organization, and I know the Maltz Museum um, and their Stand Up Against Hate project. Um, so we do have ways for our teachers to help their students navigate through this. Um, and the same with adults, same thing. If You don't have to be a student. Um, so, yeah. Um, Absolutely. I just got this question pop up. Yeah, the anti-vaxxing thing. Um, do you want to read the question, or do you have other questions you want to get to first? Um, I can read the question. Anti-vaxxers using images as comparisons to today's vaccine and mask public health mandates need to be called out as ahistorical and dangerous. And I, I would absolutely agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, these facile and ridiculous comparisons that are often made, you know, and, and as Jody was sort of saying, this idea that the it's almost become sort of a, a political a political tool to bludgeon um, your opponent with is just simply link them to uh, Nazism in the Holocaust in some way. And that's supposed to stop the, um, you know, that's supposed to stop the engagement in the conversation. And that's not what we want to do. We want to have uh, conversations. And of course, nothing like a state sanctioned mandate to save people's lives is anything like the mass murder of, you know, six million plus people. Um, and we knew we do um, need to call that out. Absolutely. And also too, it, it, it victimizes the victims again. It, it, it basically is like a double killing because you are dishonoring the memory of those who were murdered um, by making these kind of false equivalencies and you know false comparisons. Um, um, so it is problematic on many different levels. It's, 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 it's something that I would have thought um, politicians would learn, but they seem to continue, or uh, uh, not just politicians, but um, people in general, they just don't, they don't understand history and they're using it um, to promote their own um, ideology. So it's, it's very troubling. Mm -hmm. And not a, um, not a comment, uh, not a question, but a comment um, coming from, I'm trying to sort of take several things together here. Uh, let me see if I can go back and I can find it. I wanted to try to get two or three of these things put together. Um, several of the comments mentioned the United States 
not role in the Holocaust, but its inability to effectively mount any sort of, or unwillingness to mount any sort of challenge to Nazism, in essence, because, um, you know, many of the, um, you know, laws, for example, that the Nazis passed were based on uh, de facto laws in the southern United States, the Jim Crow laws, for example. Um, uh, Marcy mentioned very early on about the eugenics movement. Um, you know, th this goes back to my point that the Nazis didn't have their own original ideas. They just borrowed and radicalized everything. Um, the eugenics movement, of course, was begun in the United States and was taken to Europe and radicalized there. Um, going from, you know, from sterilization eventually to murder. Um, and this is where we could bring in maybe one of the other victims groups and the one that um, is perhaps most important um, when it comes to the evolution of the Holocaust in the earliest stages, uh, the mentally and physically handicapped. This would be another group that isn't mentioned yet. Well, this is um, where the, um, you know, where the, the structure um, and the methodology for killing is, is invented um, and its origins are. Um, and we hope to talk about that more um, as we continue on with this four part series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will talk more about that particular intersection of history. Um, and again, like Mark said, you know, Nazis didn't necessarily have original ideas, they just took them to like a different level. Um, and eugenics certainly was not something that was isolated in Germany or even the United States. It was kind of a global thing. Um, but mm -hmm. certainly the United States was um, uh, some was some a lot of the leading experts on eugenics were working in the United States. Um, and, you know, I, and again, I there's it's very like I said, it's an extremely complex history in which you have all these different factors going on. And then, you know, someone mentioned in the chat, I just saw pop up that, yeah, anti-Semitism in the United States was very, was, you know, there were polls done in the 1930s and in the 1940s during World War II asking people how they felt about Jews. And um, and some of these polls, uh, people were more um, afraid of Jews than they were of Germans. So, I mean, you know, you can't discount anti-Semitism as a global um, a global issue. You can't also discount like our policies on immigration, um, how we view refugees and um, how we view refugees certainly back then. Um, and prior to the war, we have to also remember that there was um, an isolationist um, movement going on in the United States. We didn't want to get involved in another world conflict. Um, also, too, you had the American First movement in which, again, which was, you know, they didn't want to get involved. And that was somewhat that was anti-Semitic as well um, um, in terms of, you know, um, we don't want, you know, the, you know, Jews here. So I think that you can't like, again, it's like there's so much to think about um, and it's hard for us to like look back and with the hindsight that we have now um you know and, and 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 but it's always good to ask these questions and explore them and then think about like well what are we doing now um what is our record on refugees right now um how do how is our immigration policy playing out now um and use those lessons in order to think about our own world today So in the in the chat, uh, Emma is pushing us out because she says we're we've run out of time. Yeah, um, I I just wanted to say so maybe we can stick a sort of a pin in this. Marcy's brought up uh, Father uh, Coughlin uh, from Detroit. Uh, I mentioned early on in the chat that the Protocols of the Elders of Zion um, were popularized in the United States uh, via Henry Ford's newspaper, the Dearborn Independent. Um, Dearborn sort of a center of, anti of popular anti-Semitism in the United States. And maybe we could kind of, I could leave you with uh, one sort of morsel for the next sort of series. You know, if we could time travel and we could go back to the 1920s and we could talk to people and we could say, um, one European country, is, there's going to be a war and one European country is going to try to murder the entire population, Jewish population of the European continent. The number one answer you probably would have gotten were, well, yes, the Russians are crazy 
Or number two, you would say, no, 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 not the Russians. Number two, um, they would say, well, yes, the French, they would do anything. You would be hard pressed to talk people into the Germans being the most violently and rabidly anti-Semitic. Um, and that goes back to this kind of point that Jody has been making that anti-Semitism is a necessary precondition for the Holocaust but it just doesn't go far enough to explain how the event happens. And in these further series, we're going to explain some of that further sort of complicatedness. Absolutely. And, you know, one last thing, and I know, Emma, you're, you're like, come on now, kids, let's move on. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think also, too, we have to think about, like, the German public itself in the 1920s, they weren't looking for another war. They weren't, they were still recovering from World War I. There was no way that that was even on their radar. Um, and so, and even, you know, prior to Hitler coming in the early 30s, that just wasn't something that um, was the general population wasn't really interested in. Um, so, I, again, I think um, we'll explore a lot of these different things. I know that we're going to talk about the, um, the Nuremberg laws and the Jim Crow laws in a, a series. We're gonna also talk about degenerate art, um, which was a, another method of propaganda that the Nazis used. Um, and um, and then also we're gonna, what's, what's the other one we're gonna talk about? I mean, I lost the fourth one. Propaganda. Right, and we'll talk more about propaganda. So um, um, I hope you'll join Mark and I and uh, the other speakers that we have coming um, in the next couple of months. And uh, we'll continue these conversations. And in the meantime, certainly um, all of our organizations, organization links have been put into the chat. Um, we um, we uh, look forward to um, hearing from you um, and seeing you at the next part of the series. Thank you all. Um, thank, thank you, Mark. Mark. Thank you, Jody. Thank you to everybody in our audience. Um, and Marcy, to your question, I have put the link to sign up for the next program in the chat. Um, so thank you all for coming tonight. And thank you. Thank you both. It was, uh, I, I enjoyed our conversation, Mark. So I look forward to the other ones. I as well. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Great. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.